So thank you for having me today. Um, the, I regret to say the last AAPS meeting I've been to was in Dallas. I haven't gone to any elsewhere, and that's a shame. And I look around this room and I see people who are committed and dedicated to a couple things, one of which is the integral relationship between a doctor and a patient, which is the fundamental area of why we do what we do. And secondly is the, the wraparound, which is the nature of the practice of medicine. The nature of the practice of medicine, needless to say, is impacted by many things, not the least of which is public policy. So today, as we talk about death, actually continuing on about death, part of what I'd like to address is what is happening in public policy around the world, in the United States, relative to physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. So the topics I'll cover, I'm gonna initially present my thesis, and after that you can just quit listening, of course. What is the current setting? What's the USA timeline? What about in other Western countries? And then I wanna take a little sampling of press articles and just kinda of highlight some of those to see what, uh, what uh, most people are reading. And you can't talk about this topic without actually talking about the Dutch experiment. And you'll see why later, why I call it an experiment. And then we'll encapsulate this really as a black and white phenomenon of life versus death, um, as opposed to what most of us believe, which is death is a part of life. And then if we have time, I can get into a little bit more nuance. What is my thesis on this? First of all, assisted suicide, which is a phenomenon where a physician is helping a patient die by prescription, let's call it that, becomes euthanasia when the doctor administers the drugs that they're prescribing. And then we talk about euthanasia. Is euthanasia active or passive? Well, we, we all are guilty of passive euthanasia in part, if you want to call it that, because euthanasia translated just means a good death by allowing natural death and doing what we can to support a patient while they are naturally dying. That's technically passive euthanasia by a patient who's refusing to take other means. Active euthanasia is, of course, when the physician is administering deadly drugs or otherwise. Needless to say, we've all been engaged in the debate, personally, professionally, Society has been remarkably engaged in this topic for the last 20 to 30 years. Why am I here? What have I done? So when I was a resident, I was the, a board member of the Oregon Right to Life Committee. And as a board member of the Oregon Right to Life, I was there at the time in the, in the mid, early 1980s when the Hemlock Society out of California was coming up into Oregon trying to create initiatives to bring assisted death into Oregon. So we fought it, and we fought it hard, and so I kind of led that defense. And so I've been involved in this topic ever since the early 1980s. I'm a hospice and palliative medicine physician as well as an internist and a street doctor. So I do lots of weird different things, but the issue of Hospice and palliative care is really what my primary focus has been clinically for the last 25 years. So I'm dealing with this professionally. What's at the very heart of this is the nature of suffering. Now we could talk all day about the nature of suffering, but suffering as life is ending is at the heart of the issue of physician-assisted dying. I'm calling it physician-assisted dying because, let's just make it even shorter. I'll call it assisted dying. That will encompass the whole realm. And you'll see why in a minute, because otherwise I'll be giving you a lot of words that are unnecessary. But I feel like towards the end of life, suffering is to be mollified. We have a dedication in our profession to help people by addressing their causes of suffering. Some would say it's our duty to relieve suffering. I don't believe we can meet that standard. 
You can't always relieve people's suffering, but you can always address their suffering. We can also talk about the nature of suffering in terms of existential suffering, physical suffering, psychological suffering, spiritual suffering. All of those are suffering. In fact, I would dare to say, if I asked one of you to stand up in this room that's never suffered, nobody would ever stand up. We all suffer. Suffering is a part of life. But suffering as life is ending is a different story because we are dedicated to try and alleviate suffering. As I said a minute ago, most of us believe that death is a part of life. We're not fools. All living things die at some time. It is a part of life. What I want to propose, though, is that the current maelstrom and these trends in society go counter to thousands of years of the history of the practice of medicine. Most of us recited the Hippocratic Oath. So within the context of the Hippocratic Oath, we dedicated not to give a medication to cause death. We also vowed not to commit an abortion. Interestingly enough, the trend in the, in the Western world is a trend that deviates away from that perspective that, of life being precious to death being not only acceptable but desirable. How does that happen? The history of medicine was predicated, framed on the context that we acknowledge a creator, we identify a created order, we have faith, we recognize there are things that are mysterious, we know that there's a metaphysical realm, even though we can't identify it. And most of us believe in the nature of a soul. Most of us also believe that relationships is a component of humanity that can be studied, defined. We have a whole issue of study, psychology, relational psychology, et cetera, et cetera. But is it science? No, we can apply scientific methods to that, but it's reality. And we here in this room, I would like to believe, are all realists. Which acknowledges that some things are beyond our understanding. So when we look at public policy and we look at the, the development of laws, I, I, I'm glad I followed the speaker that I did because we realized that Policy and laws are often terribly tainted. It's a whole issue of brain death. Well, take that to the next level also and apply that same principle of thought to assisted dying. Legalizing assisted dying changes the scope of a society fundamentally from a society that historically has defended life to a society now that encourages premature dying. The law has a duty to protect, and people who are suicidal, due to illness or disability or whatever reason, they need to be cared for. They don't need to be helped to kill themselves. Laws protecting life send the message that all lives are worthwhile, regardless of the state of that person or what contribution that person can make to society. I will posit that in societies like ours is trending, part of the fundamental foundation for that drift started many, many, many years before now. So the eugenics movement in the early 20th century in the United States was a powerful movement. Many of our civic leaders, political leaders, physician leaders were members of the eugenics society. When you take that same principle of understanding the foundation of change of thought, it's philosophical thought, when you look at that and you look at what happened in Germany, and you ask, I mean, any reasonable person's gonna ask, how could Germany devolve to the Third Reich? Germany in the late 19th, mid and late 19th century was the center of philosophical and religious thought and practice in the Western world. Any theologian will tell you, if you want to study theology, you have to go read the books in Germany. It was 
the epitome. What happened in the late 19th century? Well, what happened in the late 19th century was this mindset of eugenics as a part and parcel, which distilled down says that some life, some human life is better than other human life. It's that simple. Some humans are better than other humans. Some humans should live, others shouldn't. You see that evolve. That's fundamentally what has happened. And so today, what is also understandable is that when you live in a society, we all have experienced social pressure. We don't understand it always necessarily directly, but we understand it indirectly, what social pressure's like. If you've ever raised kids in their high school, junior high, you know what social pressure's like. Most of us want to think back on ourselves when we were that age and think, oh, sorry, I was stronger than that. I wasn't succumbing to social pressure. But the fact is, societies exert pressure. We as physicians feel that pressure. Here's an example. We live in an opioid crisis. I'm a hospice and palliative medicine doc. I've done pain management for 40 years. Do I feel the pressure from society not to prescribe opioids? I sure do. Did I feel that same pressure 35 years ago? I sure didn't. So it's a good example how policy and pressure, societal pressure, really influence the way people make these decisions. That's at the heart of this movement towards assisted dying. Look at Oregon. 55% of people requesting assisted suicide cited fear. Fear of what? Fear of being a burden as an influencer in their decision. So who responds to that? Disability rights people do. I love these people. They oppose lax changes in law almost universally. Lax changes in law for assisted dying. Why? Because of the increasing prejudice against them and the sense of a pressure to end their lives. So, current laws in defense of life are the best safeguard of the abuse that we've seen in almost every jurisdiction that has passed laws for assisted dying. Excuse me. <clears throat> there has been an, a progression, I should add, in each jurisdiction where safeguards have been placed to protect against the abuses that we are seeing. So these places have evidenced that there's no way by which any law legalizing assisted suicide or euthanasia can be made safe from abuse or negligence. I'll say that again. What we've observed is the evidence that there's no way by which any law legalizing assisted suicide or euthanasia can be made safe from abuse or negligence. Consequently, in each jurisdiction, there will be innocent people that die unnecessarily. Excuse me again. <coughs> So I mentioned the Dutch experiment. There's no place in the world worse than the Netherlands. I will allude to that later. But in the Netherlands, I will just summarize by saying very simply, there are thousands of patients who have been killed who did not request it. Their laws have drifted despite safeguards. There are thousands of people being killed, many in nursing homes, against their will because their lives aren't worth living and it is sanctioned by the state and permissible. We also have disabled babies who have been given lethal injections. A good example is young teenagers who've been helped to die because they're depressed and they have some form of maybe some kind of physical disability or emotional disability. We'll talk, thank you so much. <clears throat> So we have a duty. We physicians, <coughs> practitioners, <coughs> have a duty. And our duty is to be a healer. Our duty is to address suffering. We can't, as I said, we can't alleviate all suffering, but we can address all suffering. And this is inherent to our role as professional caregivers. I would also add, because I'm a palliative care doc, I'm not trying to strum up business for us, but because palliative care has become what it is, you know, most of us in this room grew up, we didn't watch that much TV, but if we did, there was Marcus Welby. Remember Marcus Welby? <laughs> 
Marcus Welby, MD. If we had the practice of medicine like Marcus Welby, MD today, there would be no need for palliative care docs. I'd love to get myself out of a job and bring back that nature of practice where a physician intimately knows patients, families, and community, right? Isn't that what we strive for in this room? I would dare say yes, and that's why I love this organization. So the evidence in countries that have legalized assisted suicide that have better palliative care than others have less assisted dying. It's, it's almost a direct correlation. So, again, I'm not trying to strum up business for us in palliative medicine. I know a lot of palliative medicine docs that aren't that principled. Some of whom have taken cases to push physician-assisted suicide on the rest of the country, palliative care docs. So, I'm not saying we're all good guys. What is the current setting? Assisted dying practices have expanded significantly around the globe in the last 20 years. We've seen it marching in the United States. The growing global aging population, the prominence of the press, of media, it's everywhere. So people can see what they want to see everywhere now. Look at the war with Hamas and Israel. Look at the narrative surrounding the war with Hamas and Israel. Use that as an example now to look at when you allow yourself to observe the press response to assisted dying, what do you see? You see these highlighted cases, these young moms who have brain tumors who move from New Jersey to Oregon so they can end their life and all the sweet thing about it. It's like, this is a con job. But that's what we're with. So as this trending is happening, we have to recognize the nature of what people are being exposed to. They're not being exposed to the horrific incidences of teenagers having assisted dying because they have some kind of autism. Yes, that's happening. So, global aging, the press, the increasing levels of chronic diseases, which of course we live longer with modern medicine, people live longer with chronic diseases that would have died years ago. And then an absence of a real conversation about the ethical and moral implications of this. That's what's disturbing. So today, assisted dying practices are legal in 18 jurisdictions, increasing the number of people with access to euthanasia and or physician-assisted suicide to over 200 million people. This was as of 2019, the latest data I could find. 16 states of the United States are discussing new legislation to bring in some form of assisted dying. Germany and New Zealand have recently overturned their bans on assisted dying. So there's a lot of confusion if you dig into it. People will define one thing differently, assisted death, assisted dying, physician-assisted suicide, euthanasia, what is euthanasia, active euthanasia, pass. It's all over the map. They, I think they do that on purpose to confuse us. So let's ignore it. Let's just stick to the basics and talk about what we're talking about. The other thing to remember today, there's no real data. There's no real data. Most countries do not keep accurate tabs on the practices, particularly the European countries. They don't keep research. They don't keep tabs on it. The consistent increase of assisted dying in the European countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, as well as places that have had laws in place longer, we are seeing a trend that has increased for people that were not particularly thought to be appropriate for it early on. So the substantive and procedural requirements, such as minimum age, waiting periods, health condition, physician consultations, reporting procedures, et cetera, <clears throat> those are becoming progressively lax in most of these jurisdictions.
research should be tied in with these practices. But I'll give an analogy. When we develop vaccines in this country, there's supposed to be adequate research, right? What happened to the control group for the jab? <laughs> exactly. So you have, an, you have an elimination of the scientific method, and that's exactly what's happened now with assisted dying practices. You cannot get good data. It just isn't available. Consequently, the people who are most at risk, vulnerable populations, um, can be caught up into this, as we are seeing over on the other side of the pond. What's helped drive these trends? Because again, as I talked a minute ago about the eugenics movement and the whole change in philosophical, spiritual foundation for Germany for them to be able to be captivated into a societal death culture. We want to understand why. Why do people embrace this? So disease-associated pain, the nature of suffering, we mentioned that. Functional and cognitive decline with age. People wanting dignity. We'll talk about dignity in a minute. But this is, this is an important desire for many people. Autonomy. So those of us who practice uh, medical ethics understand that we've got four pillars of medical ethics, one of which is autonomy. Unfortunately, in the last 25 years, and actually it's the last 35 years, autonomy trumps all the others, vis-a-vis -vis bo abortion on demand, where autonomy is the most important. In reality, it's not. I mean, in practice, it shouldn't be. Academically, it shouldn't be, but in practice, it is. There's increasing public discourse around the nature of autonomy. Quality of life. Quality of life. Again, we could talk a lot about quality of life. Who determines quality of life? Does the physician determine the quality of life? Does the spouse determine the quality of life? Can I give a little quick story? My first two weeks as an intern, I'm on uh, oncology rounds. Go in, we see the patient, the team's talking, the attending hadn't showed up yet, and this is a lady who is still getting chemotherapy, therapeutic nihilism, I like to call it sometimes. She was getting chemotherapy for whatever malignancy she had, and um, without it, she would most likely be dead in about 10 days. With it, two to three months. So we're sitting there talking about it, and we're seeing all this suffering from the chemo-induced suffering. The attending comes in, he says, so what do you all think? So we had this interesting discussion, and the attending said, what if I could help you live your life 300% longer than what you would die naturally without my intervention? <laughs> it's like, I never thought of it that way. If I could give you a month and a half to two and a half more months of life where you can interact with your family, and without that intervention, you wouldn't have it. I thought, hmm. So now I have to temper my criticisms of, of some forms of excess treatment. There is a perspective. There is a perspective, and it's the patient's perspective sometimes that is worth listening to. I'll say enough about that. Um, so the idea of autonomy and dignity, I think those are at the heart of this whole thing for an individual to be seeking this method of dying. We cannot ignore the cultural acceptance of abortion on demand. Abortion's been around for as long as humanity's been around, needless to say. Why would the Greeks 4,000 years ago be talking about giving a pessary to induce an abortion? We're not gonna do that as physicians, but it's been around it's forever. But it's the changing attitudes of the culture that are what's disturbing. And it's those same changing attitudes relative to abortion that actually lay fertile ground for the acceptance of assisted dying. Let me change course a little bit here. Excuse me. What about the U.S.? So the history in the U.S. goes back 
to the 1930s, actually, right at the same time that eugenics was really starting to get to a peak. But independent of the eugenics movement, yes, the 1930s in the United States, the Society for the Right to Die actually was formed. There was an organization trying to push assisted dying way back in the 1930s. It was not well known, um, but they, they certainly tied themselves at the hip of the eugenicists. Then in the early 1980s, the Hemlock Society, which I mentioned earlier in California that was coming up into Oregon, and they gained a lot of interest in part for two reasons. Number one, their leader was a man by the name of Derek Humphrey, and he published a book that was actually a, a widely read book. But think about what was happening in the media at that time. We went from really rudimentary media in the 19, early 50s to profound media by the 1970s, and it was everywhere. It's on in everybody's household. So the interest expanded. And one of my favorite authors wrote a great book, Sherwin Newland, a surgeon, wrote a great book on dying in America. So all this brings to, to the mindset more end-of-life issues. Two important Supreme Court decisions in 1997 ruled in favor of a constitutional right to die. Vacco versus Quill and Washington versus Glucksburg. Then in the 1990s, four states presented ballot measures to legalize physician-assisted suicide. With one, Oregon, in 1994, passing their infamous Death with Dignity Act. As we had mentioned earlier, all of these are associated with safeguards. So the Death with Dignity Act where a physician was allowed to prescribe a lethal dose of medications, but only after certain parameters were met. The patient had to be terminally ill. Things have changed. And then we had famous state cases, state court cases. Most of us remember Karen Ann Quinlan in 1976, Elizabeth Bouvia in 1983, Nancy Cruzan in Missouri in 1988 to 90, and Terry Schiavo, 2003-2004. Most of us remember those cases very well. Why? Most of us remember them because they were very emotionally impactful. We could understand both sides of each of these cases. We could. Um, we're human. But we also, as physicians who value life, can understand why those cases have to be decided in one particular way. We can get into the subtleties of that at another time. And then, 1998, you remember Jack Kevorkian, 60 Minutes, brought it into every potential home in America that had a television, broadcasting Jack Kevorkian administering lethal medications to a patient, okay? 2006, a few medical associations began to adopt policies that supported aid in dying. The American Women's Medical Association, the American Public Health Association, and the American Medical Students Association. 2014, the National Academy of Medicine, which used to be the Institute of Medicine, they published, quote, the, the dying in America, improving quality and honoring individual preferences near the end of life with recommendations for greater access to hospice and palliative care. Great! And physician-assisted suicide. 2015, the California Medical Association dropped its 28-year stance against physician-assisted suicide to provide for other end-of-life options. 2017, the Massachusetts Medical Society dropped its opposition to medical aid in dying legislation. Adopting a stance of engaged neutrality. Remember that term? I hate that term. Engaged neutrality. 2021, New Mexico passed a less stringent law that actually was much more lax and dropped many of the safeguards. One of which was 
embedded in the law was an, the loss of protection for conscience. So if you had a patient that was requesting your life, their life to be terminated, if you didn't write the prescriptions, you had to refer them to somebody who would. Yeah, very disturbing. So that being said, in 2000, it wasn't until 2011 that we had a response to this movement of really progressive over, at that time, 25 years by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. 2011, that's a long time. What about other Western countries? Canada, 2016. Colombia, 2019. Australia, recently, 2021. Other countries, including New Zealand, are now deliberating the laws to change. Let's talk about Europe specifically. Euthanasia in the Netherlands is regulated by a, quote, Termination of Life on Request and Assisted Suicide Act, passed in 2001, took place in 2002. The criteria concerned the patient's request, the patient's suffering, which had to be, quote, unbearable and hopeless. The information provided to the patient about the procedure and the absence of reasonable alternatives. They had to have consultation of another physician and the applied method of ending the life. To demonstrate their compliance, the act required physicians to report euthanasia to, to review committees. Boy, that sounds great. Those are good safeguards. From the Dutch government website, there are various ways to intentionally expedite the end of life. Euthanasia is the most explicit and is performed only when the patient has clearly expressed the wish to die. The Netherlands has statutory rules and procedures for the termination of life on request. Under Dutch law, any action intended to terminate life is, in principle, a criminal offense. The only exemption from criminal liability is where a patient is experiencing unbearable suffering with no prospect of improvement and the attending physician fulfills the statutory due care criteria. So I want to go and skip this part because of time and talk about the Dutch experiment. Because what's happening over there will invariably happen here if we aren't more diligent in fighting it, and society doesn't change its heart. Okay, sorry guys, give me a second. The Dutch experiment. So the Dutch have actually legally been killing people off since the 1970s. Why do I say legally? The law wasn't passed in the 70s, but the prosecutors turned a blind eye, as did the courts. That's important. So it wasn't legal, but it was de facto legal since the 1970s. So since the 70s, the laws have come into place. They've changed once or twice since. And what was initially presented as a last-ditch way to help elderly people in the grips of painful terminal illness has now been made legal to kill unhappy teenagers. A few years ago, there were disturbing press reports of the doctor killing of a, di a distressed 17-year-old named Noah Pothoven. Now, this story is great because it turned out to be a false story. But the Atlantic which is not a conservative publication here in the U.S., they ran a story about this. And the conclusion in that story, the thesis of that story, was this story that was published overseas about this patient could happen every day. They acknowledged that. That even though the, the story was fictitious, it could happen from the Atlantic. They pointed out that the story could be true and that, as they stated, I'll read from The Atlantic, a respected Dutch-language medical journal recently reported this. The benefits of Dutch euthanasia have crossed several red lines, or if you prefer, kept sliding down a very slippery slope. First from the elderly, now to the teens. Then from people who are actually dying and will soon be dead to those with long-term chronic conditions. Then from painful physical diseases to mental distress, basically, Depression. This slide in the Dutch experiment is depressingly obvious. The basic argument in favor of euthanasia, whatever your preferred term is, autonomy. But hardly anyone would actually argue in favor of requiring chemist shops to provide suicide booths so you can just end it all whenever you felt like it. 
If it is really up to you what happens to your body, then when you feel like giving up and do, going away with yourself, don't we have a responsibility to enable you to do that without delay as a society? Now think about the counter to that. All of us practice in the United States where a suicidal patient that's depressed, we take away their rights. Why do we take away their rights? Because we value their life more than they do. That's the society that we've grown up with. That's the society that they're trying to change. But hang on, we all have bad days. And some of us get depressed and it passes. And surely no one wants young people who have been dumped by their girl or boyfriend to feel miserable and end up dead as soon as they can make it to the boots. This is from The Atlantic. It's nice to see something that's somewhat sensible coming from the left. So what about advanced directives? We all should have them. The problem is, if public policy doesn't support the advanced directive, either for life preservation or whatever, then it's almost moot. Texas is in a quandary right now. Those of you who aren't from Texas, we're in a quandary right now. SB 11, from two legislative sessions prior, passed a, um, a law that said that a person's advanced directive can be reversed by their medical power of attorney. This is very disturbing. It is what it is. In the Dutch, getting back to the Dutch, in 2016, the Dutch health minister announced plans to draft a law that would allow assisted suicide in cases, quote, if the person feels they have completed their life. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So, the killing of children is disturbing for any of us, but it's happening. In the Dutch experiment, parents of a 16, 17 year olds are involved in the discussion, but their permission is not required. Patients as young as 12 years old can seek euthanasia with parental consent, but in about 10 cases, just in two years, children aged 12 to 17 have received euthanasia and all were for physical illnesses. More recently, what we're seeing is teenagers having, being euthanized in the Netherlands because of psychic distress. This is disturbing. So if you don't believe in the terminology of a slippery slope, so be it, but it's real. It's very real. So the argument for it, we need it, it's the compassion argument, we want it, the autonomy argument, we can control it, the public policy argument. Those are the reasons for it. But what about against it? Alternative treatments are available. Palliative care is available and it can take care of people's physical suffering. There is no right to be killed and there are real dangers of slippery slopes. They're real. We can never truly control it. We can't. The assumption that patients should have a right to die would impose on doctors a duty to kill. It is implicit, unless anybody can just go kill somebody at their request. So I see this as life versus assisted death. I think that's in the fundamental thesis that I would like to present. I think personal choice is important, autonomy is important to, to support, however, there are rights and wrongs. Life is worth preserving. The example of somebody who's depressed. We take that right away from them in that setting. Why? Because we value their life. What about compassion? I see a picture of Mother Teresa having a dying infirmed person in her arms just offering a little sip of water through a teaspoon. That is a picture of compassion as opposed to Jack Kevorkian squirting the deadly juice to that patient that he was broadcast on 60 Minutes. So we need to be aware. I would encourage all of us in this depressing moment to be aware that this is here. It's powerful. The lobbies are powerful. The medical establishment has suckered up, obviously, 
And um, the AMA, fortunately, the AMA, I don't like them, but this is one area that they've kind of held tight. And I'm proud of them for that. But so many of our other specialty societies are cowering. And it's it, this position of uh, observational neutrality, whichever, I think that's the way we say it in our hospice and palliative medicine club, uh, it's, it's not right. We need to stand up for life. So I'll stop there.